Okay, now I want to uh, spend a little time talking about going from what I call old nuclear to new nuclear. There's a lot of acronyms here. Uh, this is the graphite thorium reactor uh, in the uh, popular uh, <coughs> um, social media. It's called liquid fluoride thorium reactor. And in Oak Ridge, it was called the two fluid molten salt breeder reactor. They're all the same things. Okay, only differences in small details. So there are lots of uh, uh, people in the audience that are more expert about nuclear fission than me, but there are probably also some people who are less <laughs> expert than me. So I'll just give a very quick review of nuclear energy uh, in a nutshell. For fission, all right, not fusion. So fission, you need fuel that's capable of fissioning, and that's word for that is fissile, and there are only three in practice. They all are odd number for a technical reason. You have to have an odd number of neutrons and uh, uh, even number of protons. So the ones that we use today is uranium-235 odd, okay? That's only 0.7% of uranium. <coughs> a one that we hope, some people hope we can use is plutonium-239, and uh, what I'll talk about from thorium is uranium-233. These are not naturally existing, but you can get them. You can get something that's what's called fertile, <laughs> make it into something that's fissile by adding excess neutron. When you add a neutron to something that's fissile, this has too many neutrons, so it breaks. It uh, vibrates and breaks into two. Those have even more neutrons than they'd like, so they typically spit out two or three neutrons, these fission products. All right? So the fact that it's greater than one means you can sustain a chain reaction. The fact that it's greater than two means you can use that extra one to make something fissile, which was only fertile, and uh, maybe make even more if you're very economical of uh, the neutrons. So that's how you do it. You add a neutron to uranium-238, which is the other uh, abundant isotope with 99 0.3% of natural uranium becomes uranium-239. Two of the neutrons decay into protons, and you get plutonium-239, which is relatively long-lived. And that's most of the uh, community, when they talk about breeder reactors, that's the cycle they talk about. But there's another cycle that China and India are very interested in, because neither country has uh, uranium, but has thorium. Thorium has only one isotope, thorium-232. So if you add a neutron to thorium-232, you get two thorium-233, two beta decays, and you get uranium-233, which is fissile. That's 100% of thorium. So the way we use nuclear reactor today is that natural uranium is very hard to use by itself because there's so little fissile. So typically, in a light water reactor, you would do isotope separation to enrich the amount of uranium-235 from 0.7% to a higher value, typically about 5%. But if you count both the stuff, you know, you, you have two piles, some that you took over here, so this becomes depleted, this becomes enriched. If you count both, the fuel efficiency is still only 0.7%, and you get a little of plutonium, so it turns out it's about 0.3%, <coughs> and then the rest is depleted uranium uh, <coughs> and uh, plutonium-239, which uh, some of which you get to burn. Now, what do you do with this waste? All right. Well, one way you can do it, take depleted uranium, you put them on tanks, military tanks. Okay, They can stop shell. But how many tanks does the world need? So it's, that's not a big market. Okay, So basically, the rest is what people call nuclear waste, 99%. So the way we use uranium today, we use 1%, throw away the 99%, and we're awful at throwing away the 99%. No one even knows how to do that very well. So that's the model we have. However, this is not to denigrate present reactors. It's, it's a very uh, good design. It uses ordinary water as the coolant of the core. So you have you generate heat, you want to transfer this heat to something uh, more uh, easy to handle and uh, that you can do something. So the easiest thing is to, say, turn it into steam. So, uh, so that's the heat 
transfer ordinary water. The hydrogen in water is well matched to the mass of neutrons, so it's very uh, efficient at slowing down neutrons, which makes uh, the reactions uh, easier, okay? cross sections larger. Okay? Both are what's called a moderator, and it absorbs neutrons. <coughs> and those two characteristics make actually nuclear reactors very safe in terms of never running away. The thing you're afraid of is loss of coolant accidents. Okay? That's what happened at Fukushima. That's what happened at Three Mile Island. That's what happened in uh, Chernobyl. It's not stopping the reaction because as long as you lose the coolant, you've lost the moderator. So it stops itself. All this you know, nonsense that people spread, the fear that nuclear reactor is a bomb, that's nonsense. No reactor has run away. All right? They all stop themselves. But you have the fission products, and they continue to release heat, and they may cause meltdowns. Okay? And that's the danger. It's from that decay heat, okay? <clears throat> which was not uh, done well in the three examples I talked about. Now, there are two kinds of reactor built by Canada and by the former Soviet Union, which uses not light water, but heavy water in the case of can-do reactors, where deuterium substitute for hydrogen. You see, deuterium is a hydrogen that ate a neutron back in the Big Bang. <laughs> and so it doesn't want any more neutrons. So it's a very good moderator without absorbing neutrons. And graphite, that's the other thing that can slow down neutrons without absorbing it. And that's what was used at uh, the Russian design. But they also used water as a coolant. That was a disastrous combination. Graphite moderated water cooled. Disastrous. Now when you lose the water, you don't lose any moderator, but you lost the absorber. So what was critical now is super critical. Okay? So that's very bad design. Everybody knew it. Okay? So when people bring out uh, Chernobyl as an example, that's not going to ever happen again, even in Russia. Everybody has learned their lesson. Now, breeder reactors, there's basically two that are in contention. One was uh, pushed forward by Argonne National Lab. Other uh, groups have taken up. Now it's split off and become the Idaho National Lab, where you don't moderate. You use fast neutrons. It turns out if you don't moderate, you need much more fuel to get critical, but it's also much easier to uh, breed plutonium. All right? <coughs> to get the coolant so it doesn't absorb many neutrons, uh, you can use liquid sodium as a coolant. Now, if you know any chemistry, <laughs> you know liquid sodium is a tricky substance. You touch its air, it's on fire. It touches water, you have an explosion. Okay? So it's not impossible. People are still attempting to go this route, but it's not easy. All right? The other route is the Oak Ridge National Lab about 50 years ago, where you slow down the neutrons using graphite, but now you don't use water. You use molten salt also to cool it, and that is breathing. Okay, now thorium-232 is a byproduct of rare earth mining. Its abundance is about four times uranium-238. So that turns something which is basically unsustainable. If we were to use light water reactors and only use 1% of the uranium, this may be only 10 years before you know, the high uh, quality uh, uranium is gone. If you can breed into plutonium, uh, it's up by a factor of 100, so you're now 1,000 years. If you use thorium, it's 4,000 years. 4,000 years is almost the age of human civilization. We'd better have fusion by then, otherwise we should kick all the plasma physicists out of university. 